The Lyca Noctilux. Noctilux, if you have some rudimentary knowledge of Latin or some expert knowledge of Google Translate, will know that in English it roughly translates to night light. Not the thing in your kid's bedroom. It also means the bloody expensive one with really large aperture. This one right here is my own, obviously. This is the second time I've owned it. Bought one, sold it, regretted it, bought it again. And here we are for a bloody expensive large aperture lens. This presents really quite good value for money. Sort of. Well, in the world of Leica, it is, especially so if you bought one in 2002 for £1,500, and given the value today, it would have been better than putting your money in a savings account. Yeah, although yours is only the cheapo one, isn't it? Even a cheapo one. It's the 1.1, isn't it? Dan, there's no 1.1. That's the Nocton. That is the oh, cheaper Nocton, one. Yes. There are no cheapo Leica Noctilux options, but there are options. The OG 15mm f1.2 from 1966, designed by Helmet Marks, not the abrasions on your protective headwear. This lens is a legend, and legendary status comes from firsts. First Noctilux, first production lens ever with aspherical elements, two of them, one on the front, one on the back. If you can find one, it's available for a legendary price. But why so much? Well, the spherical elements were made on machine operated by hand, and only one pair of hands were capable of that. Gerd Bergman. So if he was on sick leave or was on holiday, no one else was making them. So not many were made at all hence legendary price. It's a fantastic option for those who like to buy lens to admire in your display cabinet. For those who want to take photos, just get the modern remake. Yes, Leica do evolve at a glacial rate, but with this they thought it was best to regress and made a modern remake of the original formula, just not made by GERD. Not many things are made by a GERD anymore, definitely not with this optical wonder of the modern world, the Noctilux 15mm f095 aspherical. It's a third of a stop faster than the f1, but in my opinion, apart from the obvious braggability, it really isn't all that. This is the one you should have, though. Well, that's the 0.95, but I actually think the F1 is the finest Noctilus. It cheap. looks better, and it's cheaper than 0.95. Don't buy the 0.95. Save yourself you some money. You better tell that to Mr... whatever his name is. It's written on top of here. And he just paid for it. Look, the, ad, the invoice is there, so don't, um, don't tell him. Hello, Mr... <laughs> Uh, he's probably got them all anyway. He probably, he probably has. He's probably got a whole lot. Yeah. He just wants that specific serial number. The modern 15mm f1.2 aspherical is good wide open, and the 095 is a fantastic performer too. It's just that the one in between is the very essence of what a Noctilux should be. They got the formula just right in 1975 with a lens designed by German bloke Dr. Walter Mandler and made in Canada. Hello, I am a German lens engineer. Wait, 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 hold on right there. Nichols, believable Canadian guy. Jordan, you're supposed to be German. Oh, good day, Walter. Sorry, you just caught me about to have breakfast. Of course, I'm having 100% authentic Siop Diable, which is French, eh? Because our Canadian country is bilingual. Anyways, I've just been given or building all those Canuck lenses that my legendary Canadian craftsman skills allow me to do, but what was that lens design you want to talk to me about? I have designed a 50mm 1.0 lens that will not look like Scheiser wide open. Oh, take off you keener, that's crazy talk. That's gonna create quite the kerfuffle when they find out how many loonies that's gonna cost, eh? It's going to be Uber amazing. So finish up your breakfast, you. Wow, hey, that sounds really great. Honestly, I can't do this, this anymore. This script is ridiculous, stupid. It's making me We really put this on pancakes, we cook with it once in a while. The States makes plenty of meals. And if Kai doesn't like it, go f himself. Tut, tut. That's what you get when you plump for the first Canadians that you ask for. Should have held out for McKinnon and Matty, right? Ah, never mind. At least we got to learn a little bit about Canadian culture. Now it's time to learn a little bit about the Noctilux f1.0. Okay, deep breath. Are you ready for the geeky bit? There are four versions of the 15mm f1. Version 1, which I had previously, has E58 or 58mm fill thread. Version 2, same thing, same optical design, but with E60 or 60mm fill thread. Version 3, same thing again, same optical design with a different hood design. Clip-on instead of bayonet. See what I mean about slow evolving? And the version 4, yes, same optical formula but with built-in hood. In my opinion, the version 4 looks the best with the built-in hood and also because at least it comes with the hood. Quite often the previous versions don't come with hood and they will set you back a bit of money to source one. 
But having said that, I never find that really flares much without a hood anyway. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter which one you go for, they're pretty much all the same, although there's probably some minor copy to copy variation, and some might have a problem with a fungal infection, yuck. But before you splash the cash, just be minded of a few things though. Now when you're using the Noctilux on the rangefinder camera, you have to be very careful and very precise with the focusing because wide open and at its closest focusing distance of one meter, yes, that's not all that close at all, the depth of field is about one centimeter. How's about that? Peaking is on full, but depth of field is so shallow. I can't actually see which bits are in focus, probably around there. Even at longer distances is not easy. And at F1, it's still going to have a thin depth of field, which can also make foreground elements look a bit odd when they're so blurry. If you're using it at F1, it's very much about the subject. I took on my first ever trip to New York and if you take photos like this, well, it could be anywhere, right? And if you have a large distance between subject and background, at F1.0, you might end up making it look like your subject has been keyed onto the background. Check that out. And one thing you may have noticed right there is the light fall off. It's a full three stops under compared to the center of the frame. Vignetting is intense. It does get worse when you put a filter on, which is what you'll need to do when you shoot in the daylight. Yes, the lens is called night light, but if you only buy a lens just to shoot at night, you wouldn't use it much, would you? Some say the vignetting is worse with the E58 because of the smaller filter thread, but I couldn't see a difference. Both as bad. But when I mean bad, I mean bad ass. Sure, a Lomo camera will vignette too, but this is posh light fall off, vignetting with the jazzles. These dark corners are designed in Germany and made in Canada. Yes, vignetting is usually seen as undesirable, but it is part of the charm of the F1 Noctilux. It's like a necessary compromise for reaching that F1 mark. And that is cool. And it really draws you into what's in the center of the frame. And most likely you want to frame your subject sort of in the center because it's really quite soft in the corners. From the center of the imaging plane, the sharpness circle is about nine millimeters either side of that. So about 18 millimeter circle. The rest of it is gooey softness. And with the lower contrast and soft vignetted corners, you don't really want to put your subjects near there. Besides, just focusing with a rangefinder patch and then reframing at close distances can easily put the subject out of focus. But look, if you can say a big F you to the rule of thirds, you'll be rewarded with some of the most unique looking images ever. It reaches some limits at F1.0, but that adds to the charm, especially given that it is a blindingly good lens wide open. Where this lens shines is closer focusing. A lot of fast 50s of that time wouldn't produce the goods close up like the Noctilux does. Now a lot of standard prime lenses have optimized performance at infinity, so close up performance is often quite meh. But the Noctilux, is a different beast. It's a lens from the 70s, that's almost 50 years ago, and it looks absolutely fantastic close up, wide open. While it won't bring out those finer details sharply, it has plenty of contrast. Not as high contrast as some modern optics, but enough to give your images sufficient bite. So you can have your bark with plenty of bite. The center bits look great for an old fast 50. The lines may not be razor sharp and the very fine details aren't crisp, but it looks plenty punchy in those center bits, just enough for it to be flattering on human subjects. But having said that, this is a more versatile lens than the OG 50mm f1.2 and the 50095. The OG lens didn't get any more refined when stopping it down. This does. Sure, you're looking at this lens to shoot wide open with it, but if you want to keep the Noctilux permanently mounted on your M, and why not? It's good to know that it starts losing the wild, soft, dark corners and starts pushing the sharp bits out towards the edges once you stop it down a couple of stops. The 50095 is refined, perhaps a bit too refined. It's a bit clinical and it's huge. Don't get me wrong, mister. It's a fantastic lens. It performs excellently at F095 in a very modern way, but it's like a modern Golf GTI. Faster, more comfortable, more refined, but it will never be as raw, as rough and ready as the Mark I or even Mark II. The F095 is clinically good, but that leaves me feeling a little bit cold. The F1 is sort of bonkers, which is good, and smaller and lighter. Actually, you know what? I take it back when I say it's very much about the subject because the biggest thing about the Noctilux is the character of the bokeh. It's probably all you look at when you look at the photos from the Noctilux. Bokeh, unlike no other. Look at the shallow depth of field, goodness. That looks fantastic, doesn't it? 
It isn't as well behaved as a modern made lens, but a bit of unruliness ends up making great looking bokeh. It will make those subjects really stand out, pop out of your photo. It's not a lens for replicating the scene as accurately as possible. It makes wobbly, ethereal looking art out of your scene. It's a no-coin needed bokeh vending machine, dishing out gloriously unexpected gorgeous out of focus elements that will surprise you every single time. The funny thing though is that stopping it down a stop to f1.4, the bokeh looks like any normal lens, but rotating the aperture ring slightly to the right unleashes hell. It can be a well-behaved lens, but at the same time is capable of boking all over some granny's purple rinse too. The bokeh can verge on the jarring and focus on something a little further away, but 9 times out of 10, the bokeh is stunning. Close up tends to look the best. The background bits are thrown so far out of focus that it ends up as a dreamy, creamy mess. Mostly, it takes what you see and regurgitates that into a seriously mushy, bokehified image. Those problematic specular highlights from the tree leaves that might often end up as harsh edged balls end up looking so creamy looking, and towards the periphery, those bokeh balls end up looking like rugby bokeh balls. The spherical aberration helps to make them a little swirly on edges too. It's not as sharp as modern optics, it's not as well corrected, it does suffer from a bit of coma and chromatic aberration, but it's still very good at f1. More than adequately sharp in the centre, wide open, close up, which is most likely how this lens will be used. It is this blend which makes it shine when shooting in the dark, but produces dreamy daytime images too. It creates images that are not quite perfect, and that is exactly why it is perfect. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. You can take a free trial with Squarespace and 10% off your first order. It's easy peasy to set up a website, loads of templates and 24 seven customer service. You can't go wrong, give it a try. Link below, thanks for watching, see ya. What was that lens design you want to talk to me about? I have designed a 50 millimeter one point. Oh, that was terrible, man. That's like the Swedish chef from the Muppets. Just, I'll do better. You've seen Strange Love so many times. I oh know, yeah. Just try. So it's a bit. It's got a bit too much oh, patina for me. It's the Dan Chung edition. Actually, it's not the Dan Chung edition because you didn't do that. Should we paint it pink? You buy it first, and I'll paint it, paint it pink. And get it. So M9 is a good size. It's not exactly very good at 6400 ISO though. Doesn't matter. Get the oh, the Nocti Lux, and that's what we're talking about today. Good link, wasn't it? Good segue that. Yeah. yeah.